Thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice. You guys are amazing. This practice is amazing. Whew, I just got done doing a Q&A. Thank you for sending your questions. Thanks you. Thanks you. Thank you for emailing and uh, commenting. It's a vulnerable position we take when we send an email or a question. You know, we whittle down so much of what's going on in our heads into short statements that we hope will carry the information we actually want to uh, transmit. It's hard. Language is full of tripwires and pitfalls and so on and so forth. So I admire your courage. And uh, once again, I'll say it again. Thank you, Shirley. Um, we're continuing now with what actually has changed a little bit in my understanding, uh, all these numbered stanzas. I don't know that that needed to be done, but in Suzuki's translation, he's got these stanzas uh, numbered. And so I, I uh, as we were reading it, I was reading it, it seemed like he was about to, uh, Mahamati, list his 108 questions. And I guess he pretty much did. But as we'll see here, the numbered stanzas shift from uh, numbering possible questions to also responses from Shakyamuni. So um, let's just read through it and see how this develops. But certainly so far, we've seen quite a laundry list of questions. Yeah. And now we're at stanza 52. And as, as um, written here, how many sorts of established truths are there? Interesting question. And how many of philosophical views? Whence is morality and what constitutes the being of, bhikshu, of a bhikshu? Tell me. So again, see, there's several questions in this one stanza. So I'm sure there's at least 108 total if we take them all apart. But what's an established truth? That's an interesting question simply because in language and in our mental capacities, somebody who is teaching us or offering us knowledge so that we can teach ourselves, which is actually what's happening, has to establish certain knowable conditions, tendencies, in order to then be able to introduce more evolved ones, because without the earlier ones, the evolved ones would simply go over our heads. Makes sense, right? I mean, if you didn't first learn what an alphabet is, then how could you learn the letters of that alphabet? And once you learn the letters of that alphabet, you must then learn the rules, the grammatical rules of how to use those letters in combination to make something called a word. And then more grammatical knowledge on how to use those words to make a sentence, a paragraph, a, a story, a novel, a newspaper article. But if you start with somebody who's capacity doesn't even know what an alphabet is and demand that they write down a novel or a story or a letter, how confused would that person be? So 
in the context of how many established truths are there, the same applies to understanding Buddhism and attaining training a mind to reach a place that would otherwise seem magical, mystical, if not for the minutia of understanding how that mind works and how it can then be used to gain insights into greater potential mind, understanding, experience. How do we experience, right? So where are these levels of truths? And how many philosophical views, how many of these truths are just egotistical understandings, right? Of our selfness, identity, so that we can get to this point where we can transcend that, right? This is the cusp that we're constantly traveling with Mahamadi's questions here. Whence is morality? That's an odd political question, isn't it? Again, because he's stuck in the ego reality. As psychological beings, how do we categorize our psychology with reference to our fellow man and women, obviously, but language. And what constitutes the being of a bhikshu? What differentiates a monk from everyone else? Well, I have a whole video on that, don't I? A monk is somebody who's assiduously dedicated to his study of Buddhism or whatever system, yeah? That's just a monk, is a, is a dedicated student. 53, what is meant by a state of revulsion? Yeah, I don't like that word myself. I understand its use or turning back. Maybe better. Whence is a state of imagelessness, which is realized by the Pratyaka Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, and Shravakas? I don't know that that's an accurate statement, but certainly to Mahamati it seems so. Again, the two go hand in hand. Revulsion really is a word trying to point at a turning away from samsaric attachments. But without understanding fully the mind and the potential of the mind, if you offered and proposed to people a loss of, because it would be perceived as a loss, yeah, of all the attachments to the stuff, what were that, where would that leave you? What would that leave you? Where would you go? Right? You would still perceive that from the standpoint of self. What happens to me if everything I identify me with is gone? Then what is me? Yikes, that's scary. That's frightening. Is that the void? Self-annihilation? I go to this magical void, this place without place? I mean, it must have been truly frightening and still is to this day to those who don't understand. Who think that the quietude is nothingness, nomina. It's a place without instantiation. But the conscious mind that experiences that place of non-instantiation understands the instantiations as being really a playful experience of just expressing the totality of potential in innumerable forms. How magical is that? But not magical in the sense of something from nothing, magical in the form of entertainment, of participation, of being in and with. 
By whom are the psychic powers of this world attained? What are the superworldly ones? By what means does the mind enter upon the seven stages? Tell me. Again, these are all questions from a position of I, self, ego. Not just being a process that is instantiating moment to moment, creating time space just for the habit energy of perceiving, just being moment to moment to moment. That's tough to imagine and appreciate how empowering, how the largesse of that is unfathomable to a human mind that has compacted itself into this one color of everything. This Sylvain, this Frank, this Peter of, this Dolly of, this Susan of all the universe. It's such a minute understanding of life and everything. And yet people build their entire lives around that. That's how big an ego can grow to encompass all things. Albeit through this very minute point. Buddhaness liberates you from the constructs and constrictions of that point, and boom, you are the universe. How amazing. But we're not there yet, right? Mahamadi is still asking all of these earthbound, samsaric, stressful anxieties that he has about his practice. Wow. How many kinds of brotherhood are there? Right? There's a brotherhood of siblings. And there's a brotherhood of members. There's a brotherhood of cultures. There's a brotherhood of, of skill sets. There's a bro right? How many kinds of brotherhood are there? And how does a dissension take place in a brotherhood? Oh, you're, not, you're no longer part of the brotherhood. What happened? Whence are medical treatises for beings? Tell me, how do we know how to fix one another physically? Where does that come from? Wow, he's all over the map, isn't he? You say that you were among the Buddhas Kashyapa, Krakuchanda, and Kanakamuni. Tell me wherefore so, O great Muni. See, this person is, Mahamadi, is lost in these personages and perceiving them all as actual beings, entities, physical beings. He doesn't understand skillful means yet, evidently, to ask a question like that. Whence is the doctrine that there is no ego soul in beings? Finally. Finally, we get a bodhisattva, mahasattva, who's educated enough in the study of Buddhist, Buddhism to understand that there is no soul. And so he's asking, where, where is the methodology? Where is the doctrine that proves that there is no ego soul and he's saying it correctly, because that's what soul is. Soul is a bag of ego that's supposed to transcend time. That's the greatest magical illusion of humanity. That's where all religion comes from. Buddhism has no room for that egomaniacal thinking. It discounts it as simply not even worth thinking about. There is no soul. There cannot be something called a soul. Nothing exists in and of itself. Impermanence. Hmm? Whence 
Whence is the doctrine of eternity and of annihilation? See, this is a call back to Hinayana. It's not about annihilation. That's why the word revulsion is used instead. It's a turning away from all the attachments. It's not an annihilation of them. It's an annihilation, if you want to use that word, of our emotional attachments to that stuff. Our, our building of our ego pyramid on a base of ownership, of definitions, of stuff. From which we identify the self, the ego. Wherefore do you not any, everywhere, wherefore do you not everywhere announce the doctrine of mind only as the truth? Because that doctrine of mind only is flawed. Mind only, strictly speaking, would have you saying to one another, none of this is real. Everything is constructed by mind. And that's confusing and inadequate because it doesn't explain that these things which our mind constructs exist. This book exists. We've discussed how the book exists. But when it comes to the mind and the mind's cognitions and experiences, that defines our relationship with the book. Not the book itself. Yes, we can conjure an idea and construct something physically to embody that idea. But the mind-only doctrine is trying to address our categorization and identifying of everything and in our minds constructing the attachment, the relationship with this other which our mind makes permanent there's the identification of the problem this is a moment to moment instantiation of energies and it's degrading as I hold it but in my ego mind this book exists and it'll outlast me so therefore, it's real, real, real. So this is the dividing line of misunderstanding in Buddhism. is to understand that as real as this book is that I'm thumping right now, as a real thing, it's not the book we're talking about. It's about my adherence to, my possessing of, my fear of losing uh, the book. That's where the problem is located. In my mind, I am adhering the very identity of self to one of zillions of facts that I'm holding this book. It's almost like saying, because this book, I exist. Does that start to sound ridiculous? This is what Shakyamuni is pointing out. This is the location where we break ourselves free from ego to simply participating and witnessing. Look, book. It doesn't shape me, nor do I shape it. We are existing moment to moment through time. Look at this book. No attachment. No little yeah, energetic stimuli. Whatever you want to vision in your mind. So these are important questions. From our perspective of Lotus Sutra Buddhists. We can see that. 
with our minds. At this time, there were very few, if any, who could see that with their minds. It confounded them. What is meant by the forest of men and women and by the forest of Karitaki and Amali? Whence are the mountains Kailasa, Kakravada, and Vrajsamanana? Among these, whence are the mountains decorated with various sorts of jewels and filled with... All these questions are about the stories, the skillful means. His Mahamadi can see cannot seem to distinguish between the stories and what the stories are trying to describe, a truth that transcends the story, the meaning, in other words. He's really, really, really stuck on the words, basically. Hearing this, which constitutes the wonderful doctrine of the Mahayana and also the most excellent heart of the Buddhas, the great hero, the Buddha, the one most excelled in the knowledge of the world, spoke thus. So now Shakyamuni begins to respond to this litany of questions from Mahamati. It looks like I've lost some frames. Hopefully we'll be okay. Got to keep an eye on that. So Shakyamuni says, well done, well done. O Maharprajna Mahamati. Listen well, and I will tell you in order regarding your questions. How he's going to remember the order of all these questions I'm impressed. <laughs> birth, no birth, nirvana, emptiness, transmigration, having no self nature, Buddhas, sons of the pra Paramitas, the Sharvakas, Bodhisattvas, the philosophers, those who are capable of formless deeds, the Meru, Oceans, mountains, islands, lands, the earth. The stars, the sun, the moon, the philosophers, the Ashura. Didn't he already mention the philosophers? Anyway. Emancipations. The self-masteries. The psychic faculties. The dhyanas. The samadhis. The extinctions. Nirodha. The supernatural powers, the elements of enlightenment, and the paths, the yanas, the unmeasurables, the aggregates, skandhas, and the comings and goings. Again, he's just repeating all of the same questions that Mahamati asked, but he's being more direct in his quotations from the skillful means. Samapatis, the extinctions, the stirrings of mind, explanations in words, the sita, manas, and vijnanas, egolessness, the five dharmas, self-nature, the discriminating, the discriminated, the visible world, dualism, whence are they? Various forms of vehicles, families, those born of gold, jeweled, and pearls. The Ichantika, the original elements, the wandering about. One Buddhahood. Knowledge, the known, the marching, the attainment, and the existence and non-existence of beings. How are horses, elephants, deer caught? Pray, tell me how. What is a proposition, a teaching established by the conjugation of reason and illustration? Whence is cause and effect? Various errors. And also reason. Why the statement that there is nothing but mind? 
that there is no objective, literally seen world, that there is no ascending of the stages. Whence is the state of imagelessness and revulsion, which is a hundredfold? You tell me. Likewise, about medical treatises, arts, crafts, sciences, and teachings, and also, what are the measurements of the mountains, Sumeru, and the earth? What are the measurements of the ocean, moon, and sun? Tell me. How many particles of dust are there in the body of a being? Now we start to get to that wonderful device of Buddhism that says, okay, if we're going to talk about anything, let's whittle it down to its essentials. How many of the coarser ones, of the finer ones, and of the middle ones? This, these, and dust is the smallest particle uh, of something that was available 3,000 years ago to discuss. But obviously this is pointing to the constructs of the body that are far, far more plentiful, bountiful, and in existence than the human senses can discern on their own, right? Today we know we have to have super powerful equipment to be able to see the nature of blood cells, right? You, couldn't, you could see blood 3,000 years ago, but you had no idea, although you had some idea just through time and observation, that blood also has constituent parts. Hmm? How many particles of dust in every land? How many in every dvana or danva? In measuring distance, how much is a hasta, a danu, a krosa, a johana, a half johana? How many of rabbit hairs, of wind, window dust, louse eggs, or ram's hairs, or of barley. He's talking about minutia here, right? How many grains of barley in a prashta? How many grains of barley in a half prashta? Likewise, how many drops, how many in a drona, in a karya, a laksha, a koti, a vima, vimvana? How many atoms are there in a mustard seed, he used the word atoms. 3,000 years ago, atoms. Now, this is a translation, right? But still, Shakyamuni is talking about something, a particle, a, a, an, a unit of measure, a physical measure, beyond observation, that we know must exist. They knew then. I mean, this is incredible insight. Think about it. How many mustard seeds are there in a rakshika? How many in a bean? In a dharana? In a mashaka? How many dharanas are there in a karsha? How many karshas in a pala? Now, we can go and define all of these words, but obviously you get the point here, right? And how many palas are there in a Mount Sumeru, which is as hu a huge accumulation of masses of these minute, minute things, yeah? You should ask me thus, O oh son. Why do you ask me otherwise? How many atoms are there in the body of a Pratyaka Buddha, of a Shravaka, of a Buddha, and of a Bodhisattva? That would be an interesting question because as you and I know, a Buddha is not a human. It's not a thing at all. It's a perceptive function. Why do you not ask me in this wise? How many atoms are there at the top of a flame? How many atoms are in the wind? How many in each sense organ? How many in a pore of the skin, in the eyebrows? Now he's really focusing in on the minutia of 
what the ego is attached to. Do you see why he's saying this? Atoms, atoms beyond your ability to use your normal senses. You have to use your mind to perceive of atoms, right? So this is a direct confrontation to the construct of the ego, the mind only. What is the mind? How many atoms are in the mind? Hmm? Whence are these men of immense wealth, kings, great sovereigns? How is the kingdom taken care of by them? And how about their emancipation? Of what source is their importance, their hierarchy, their authoritarianism? What is that based on? Did somebody give them the power? Did they take it? Is it some negotiation in between? Uh. Tell whence is prose and meter. Why is sexual desire universally cherished? Whence is the variety of foods and drinks? Whence the man-woman forest? How did that come about? Why? There's that question again. Rather, how? And you'll notice, not a lot of whys in this. A lot of how. Wherefore are the mountains of Vajrasamhanana? Tell me whence, wherefore, are they like a vision, a dream? And a Fata Morgana, which I don't know what that is. Whence is the arising of clouds, and whence do... The seasons rise. Whence is the nature of taste? Whence is a woman, man, and hermaphrodite? We don't call them hermaphrodites anymore, do we? Intersex, I think, is the uh, modern term. Whence are the adornments and the bodhisattvas? Ask me, O son... O oh, my son, son, it's a language device. We'll just go with it for now. Whence are the divine mountains embellished by the rishis and the Gandharvas? The Gandharvas. Whence is the way of emancipation? Who is in bondage? By whom is he delivered? Ah, ah. What is the state of one who practices tranquilization? What is transformation? And who are those philosophers? What is meant by non-existence, existence, and non-effect, or no effect? When arises the visible world, how can one be cleansed of false intellection? Whence does false intellection arise? The nature of attachment, right? Whence arises action? Where does that start? And starting is an action, right? And where is, <laughs> whence its departure? <laughs> when does it begin? Tell me, how does the extinction of thought take place? And what is meant by samadhi? Well, it's not the extinction of thought. You can't stop thought. That's also a great misunderstanding of certain sects of Buddhism, yeah? And students all around. We're not trying to stop thought. Rather, the attachment to the thoughts. We don't want to kill all the monkeys. We just want to sever, we want to quiet them. We want to sever our attachment to those monkeys. The monkeys are just doing what monkeys do. Don't fault the monkeys. It's your attention to them that's the problem. <gasps> Did a light bulb just go off? Whew. 
Who is the one that breaks through the triple world? What is the position? What is the body? Wherefore the doctrine that begins have no ego soul? What is meant by a teaching in accordance with the world? Right? Again, we're circling around the same point. Who is doing what? Is it the mind only? Is it some negotiation of self, ego, and the physical world? What's going on? Do you ask me about the marks? The indications, the characteristics? Do you ask me about egolessness? Do you ask me about the womb? About the Naya philosophers? O son of the victor? An appellation of a advanced bodhisattva, Mahamati, yeah? How about eternalism and nihilism? How is the mind tranquilized? Again, how about speech, knowledge, mortality, family? Mahamati. What is meant by reasoning and illustrating? By master and disciple. <laughs> by manifoldness of beings, food and drink, sky, intelligence, evil ones, and the statement that there is nothing but the thought constructed. So Shakyamuni is going to address all these things. What do you ask me concerning trees and vines? What about diversity of lands and about long penance and rishi? What is your family? Who is your master? You tell me. Who are the people who are despised? How is it that in the yoga you do not attain enlightenment in the world of desire? But that is in the akanishta. There is realization. What do you ask me about reasoning? What about psychic faculties belonging to this world and about the nature of a bhikkhu? Do you ask me about Buddhas of transformation, Buddhas of maturity or recompense, reward? Hmm? About Buddhas of the knowledge of suchness? And whence is the bodhisattva in all of this? Yeah. You ask me, Mahamati, about the lands that are devoid of light, resembling a lute, a drum, and a flower, and about the mind abiding in the seven stages. You ask me such and many other questions which are in accordance, in accordance with the marks of truth or characteristics of truth and free from erroneous views. Part three, I will instruct you as regards realization and its teaching. Listen to me intently. I will give you an explanation of the statements, Mahamati. Listen to me in regard to the 108 statements as recounted by the Buddhas. At that moment, Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, said to the Emancipated One, what is meant by the 108 statements? Shakyamuni, the emancipated one, said, A statement concerning birth is no statement concerning birth. A statement concerning eternity is no statement concerning eternity. Do you see what he's doing? You're asking me about birth, but your question isn't about birth. Your question is about your experience and how to understand your perceptions of the world at large. And you're funneling that into a moment that is amorphous, that doesn't really describe anything because we know there is no such thing as birth-death. That that birth-death is a provisional understanding of this moment-to-moment time-space 
that we're moving through, our momentum. That momentum is happening and that each moment within it is simply marking the characteristic of the momentum. But, so the question about birth isn't so much about the traditional sense of the word birth, right? Womb, child, so on. The topics thus negated are as follows. So now he's just going to list all these topics that are look like questions about something which they're actually not questions about whatever that thing is. Again, Buddhism is about the mind. It's about the process of life, not the instantiations one at moment to moment. Those, those are distractions, really. from Not distractions from being, but distractions for understanding the process. The characteristic marks, abiding and changing, moment. Self-nature, emptiness, annihilation, mind. The middle, permanence, causation, cause, the passions, desire, means, contrivance, purity, inf um, inference, or conclusion. Illustration, a disciple, a master, a family, a triple vehicle, imagelessness, vows, the triple circle, form, duality of being and non-being, bothness and noble wisdom of self-realization, the bliss of the present world, lands, atoms, water, a bow, reality, numbers, mathematics, psychic powers, skies, uh, sky, clouds, arts, crafts, sciences, wind, earth, thinking, thought constructions, self-nature, the aggregates, being, insight, nirvana, that which is known, the philosopher's disorder, a vision, dream, a mirage, a reflection, a circle made in the dark by a firebrand, the city of the Gandharav, Gandharvas, the heavens, food and drink, sexuality, philosophical views, the paramitas, morality, the moon, sun, and stars, truth, effect. Okay. Why is he doing this? He's trying to disassemble, di discomport Mahamati from his ego's habit energy of materializing words. He's trying to break Mahamati loose by saying a statement concerning this is not a statement concerning this. You have to look beyond what you think you're saying and ask yourself why you think you're saying that. And that is the root of the question, not the thing you're pointing to, because that's a provisional non-existent thing. We've already discussed that, but you're just doing that dual thing in your head where you can say one thing while you don't understand what you're truly asking. And in the process, you're negating yourself. You're not asking what needs to be asked. And it's in there, but that's not what you're focusing on. You're focusing on the identification. All your questions are about what you identify with instead of the nature of the identification in the first place. So when you ask about, here's another one, errors, the seen world Protection, dynasty, rishi, kingdom, uh, apprehension, treasure, explanation, ichantika, man, woman, sense organs. These are all things that you're attached to, that you're identifying with. They're not the real subject of your questioning. This is what you, Mahamati, are missing in your practice, in your understanding of the teachings. These are the 108 statements recounted by the Buddhas of the past. In other words, the enlightened minds 
throughout time have addressed all of these questions by addressing their fundamental reason for being questions. They are transcendent of those ego realms. He hasn't quite said that yet, but that's what he's saying. Where are we time-wise? Okay, we're going to wrap it up. This uh, We're going to part four here. At that moment, Mahamadi, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, said to Shakyamuni, in how many ways does the rise, abiding, and ceasing of the Vijnanas take place? And that is a question which we constantly review regarding the nature of reality. Right? That everything arises, abides, and, and dissolves, goes away. What's the word here? Ceases. I don't like the word ceases because it implies that something ceased. <laughs> and nothing ceased. There was just a, an instantiation of energies that transforms, decays, and goes back to being quiescent, which is our goal. To exist happily, moment to moment, in life, in our moment to moment existence, without the cacophony of engagements, entanglements in the stuff we're in, free to enjoy and participate without the commitment of self-identification, identity within it. It's hard to put words around this Buddha-ness, but we do experience it when we chant, when we invoke our Buddha-ness with our perfect mirror, this mandala, we open that mental gateway into observation, free of the habit energy of attachment, of ownership. If there's no ownership, there's no loss. There's just being with. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice. Thank patrons, those of you who can afford e even a little bit, uh, occasionally or regularly to support this channel we're on a mission to get enough in the coffers to be able to, first of all, get a powerful desktop computer to create these videos without these dropped frames, right? So we can have a clean communication platform, after which, at some point, we'll be able to make this a live broadcast. It's just me here. So... Those facilities actually are quite costly. And so to those patrons who can afford to do so, um, all of us are deeply appreciative of your efforts. And if all you can do is like and subscribe, thank you. That's so essential, right? To get our Sangha to grow. So thanks again. Be kind to yourself. Keep your practice strong. And I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.